Hi, Pastor Anthony here. At Vintage Faith Church, we stand behind the Bible's claim to be the Word of God, and we believe that the Scriptures contain everything needed for life and godliness. The Scriptures testify to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray that this recording stirs your faith towards that end. This is in no way meant to be a substitute for the local church gathering, which we believe is critical to your growth as a Christian and your walk with Christ. We pray that you will find the sermon edifying and challenging. Thank you for listening. Okay, so just a few opening questions, maybe self-diagnostic questions, and you don't not to be answered out loud, and if you're with a a spouse, not for the spouse to answer for the other spouse, although you can have that conversation um, maybe later today. But but here's a few questions. Um, Do you use your speech more often to build people up or to tear them down? Do you think, and, and this is going to be hard, maybe someone else that knows you well needs to answer this, but when, when people talk to you, do they leave encouraged or worn out and dejected? Do you use your speech to argue or to seek peace and unity? And here's one that should sting us all in some way. Do you stretch the truth or bend the truth to your advantage? And again, I I ask it like that because I don't think anyone in here would say that they outright lie, although some of us would, um, that we're liars. But do you stretch it? Do you bend it to suit your purposes? This is what our text is going to be dealing with today. It's highly practical. Um, In fact, for the next three weeks, four weeks, it's highly practical practical, um, very practical Christian living type stuff. In fact, it's, it's really all just a continuation of where we were last week. And if you remember, Paul said, do what? Take off the old self and put on the new self. And then, and then this week and next week and the week after, he's just unpacking, hey, here's what that looks like in case you don't know. Um, I'm going to start here in James, though. Because a lot of our text today is about our speech. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And James says this. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Wow. (laughs) Right? Like, what James is getting at and what Paul is going to be getting at today is we can do a ton of damage with our words. And we can also build up and we can do a lot of good with our words. But I I just kind of want to draw your attention to this idea of speech. Before we get into our text today, I want you to think about it. If you remember last week, Paul ended with this idea of we're being made in the image and likeness of God. We're being made into his image and likeness. That image has been marred in the fall and through Christ We are becoming more and more human. One of the ways in which we are made in God's image and likeness is we talk. We communicate. And if you think about, this is pretty obvious, but if you have a dog or a cat or some kind of animal, they do not talk. You might think they do, but they don't. We will often say Charlie is talking to us in our house and, you know, he's just making noises and, yes, he's communicating, but he does not communicate with speech. Our God is a God who communicates with speech. If you think about this for a moment, we are a people. If you know and belong to Jesus Christ, we are a people centered around a book, 
Like God has spoken, and he's spoken very clearly. In fact, I don't know if you've ever considered the New Testament is written in Koine Greek, a very precise language. So God has chosen to communicate very precisely to his people, and one of the ways we image him is we also communicate. Not exactly the same. Let's go to Genesis 1-3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. We don't image them in this way, right? No one in here speaks things into existence. Um, But our speech does have power. Again, we can use our speech to, we're going to see today, to build up, or we use our speech to tear down. And this is all going to be set in the context of the local church, but it will also practically speak into your marriage, into your family, children, friendships, work. But the context here we can't forget is local church, church. Paul's talking about unity in the church. But I just want you to be thinking, again, I'm setting this up with the idea that our words have power. I don't know if this phrase is still used, but I remember it as a child. My mom is in the room, and she probably remembers it as well, but it's the old saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's a lie. That's a lie. Who of us in this room cannot right at this moment recall a time When somebody said something and cut you down and you remember it to this day. In fact, in some way, whatever was said to you probably affected the course of your life. Words matter. If you're a parent in here and you have kids, remember that words matter. They need to be encouraged. We need encouragement. We are a people that need encouragement. Yes, we need to speak the truth in love, but we need to be encouraged. Our words have power. So let's go to Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. Again, I'm just kind of setting up the text today. If you remember, in Ephesians 4, this is the text that Adam from Missio preached. Um, Paul made a shift from Here's what God has done for you to now, therefore, live like this. And it starts Ephesians 1 to 3, or 4, 1 to 3. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So everything we read from 4 to 5 in Ephesians is centered right there. Paul is saying, you have been blood-bought, Jew and Gentile. You are now, you were hostile. That, that dividing wall of hostility is now gone. You are one in Christ. Therefore, maintain that unity. Maintain that unity. And we're going to be looking at that for the next um, few weeks. How to live in the image and likeness of God and maintain that unity. Psalm 133, 1. This is David, King David. says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Anyone in here that has kids and, and me as your pastor, when I, when I feel the church is, okay, we're uniting, we're coming around the same things, oh, that's beautiful. If you're a father or a mother, when your kids are getting along, it's like, this is amazing. This is great. Unity is good. And unity in the church makes God smile. It makes him happy. All right, let's get into our text today. So I want, again, think about all this as threats to the unity in a church. And again, it extends beyond that, but that is the immediate context. Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, 
for we are all for we are members one of another. So Paul's calling back here Romans and Corinthians, we're members of one another. He's talking about the church here. The neighbor in, in view here is the church. And I want you to, to notice that today he's going to have a bunch of uh, negative commands, positive commands, and reasons for those commands. It, that's kind of the way it's going to flow. If you look at this text, if it's still up on the screen, he's saying, stop lying, put away falsehood, right? Stop lying. That's the negative command. The positive command, speak the truth with your neighbor, and then the reason. Why? Well, we're members one of another. So when we deceive each other, when we lie to each other, when we shade the truth, we're we're actually affecting the whole body. This is the same idea of men and women. We're going to get to it in Ephesians 5 in a marriage when he calls men to love their wives, and he's like, she is part, she's your body. You guys are one flesh. Stop fighting against her. It's the same idea. We're members of one body, therefore we should speak the truth. And brothers and sisters, you, you may have been part of churches um, that, that have been ravaged by this. Some of you I, I know have been Christians for a long time, and, and you've seen this, this go on in churches. Praise God we've had unity here in Vintage Faith. Praise God for that. We have not seen this, but what can happen in churches is, is lies start spreading, and someone wants to get their way, and it's, okay, I'm going to shade the truth and leave this out and leave that out and, and say it this way, and Paul is saying, stop it. Don't act like that. Speak the truth. We're all one body. All right, he goes on in 26 and 27, and he says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Be angry and do not sin. So he's saying here, okay, you might have a reason, a real reason to be angry. But don't sin in that anger. Don't feel that you need to vent your anger. Years ago when I was in the corporate world and and had people working for me and um, realized that I did have a problem with venting my anger and, and really it took, took years to get to the root of why. why. Why was I so angry? But there was a point in my, in my life, it was a few year period, where I felt the need every time I was wronged or I felt my rights or something went wrong that needed to be said, I felt the need to say it and I felt the need to say it firmly and in anger. And I can tell you the only thing that did was cause problems everywhere I went until I realized one day that I'm every time I do this two days later I I feel the need to apologize and and go to this person and say I was wrong and it kept happening and happening and then I realized okay why am I getting angry? And many of you, you might struggle with anger. And I would just um, encourage you just to really think about the root. What is getting you mad? Because there's a root, and it's usually an idol of some sort. And that's a whole nother sermon, maybe a whole nother sermon series. But something is getting you angry. And for me, I knew exactly what it was. And once I identified it, I, I was better able to deal with it. But Paul's saying, hey, don't let that fester. We don't take this literally. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. It's not literal. You you can question me after if you want, but it's not literal. There's places where the sun doesn't go down for for some time. Um, This is just the idea. Quickly deal with it. Nip it in the bud because what happens when anger is not dealt with, it turns into a bitter root. And that's a whole nother problem. So I would just ask you this morning... um, I know some of you, you might not struggle with anger, but some of you do. You've confessed it to me. Um, what, what is the root of that? What is the root of your anger? What is the root of your anger? And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus equates our anger with murder. 
being angry. And in, in, in particular, if you read that, it's a very sinful anger, but he equates it, in a, it, not even in a sense, he equates it with murder, our anger. So right now, Paul is saying, hey, stop lying and stop being angry. And if, if we are angry, we're giving an opportunity for the enemy. It's where the enemy gets involved and he starts working in those places. He goes on in, in Ephesians 4.28. Um, this is the only one not having to do with, with speech. Uh, um, he says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So, so again, I want you to notice here there's a, a pattern You've got the negative command, stop stealing. You've got the positive command, work. And then you've got the reason, so that you have something to share, so you can be generous. So I'm going to guess right now, and I I could be wrong, but I'm going to guess there's probably not a huge stealing problem in the the congregation. Um, Maybe. Um, but, but I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, but, but what could it be? How can we read this and say, okay, let's let this land on me in some way? Well, I think the part that lands on us should, should be we should be generous. We should be sharing with people that, that are in need. And, and the, there's only one way to do that. You've got to work and have resource to share. Otherwise, you can't share. Otherwise, you'll be in the position where you need, and that's not bad. We have all been in positions of of need, but I think there's something here to to think about. Like, okay, if I can get out of that position of need into a position of where I can be generous, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. All right, so Paul, I, I just want you to notice something in these few verses. He is saying, don't be a lying And if we equate anger with murder, don't be a lying, murderous thief. Does that sound like anyone you know? Don't say, okay. (laughs) Not your coworker. I'm not, that's not where I'm going. I'm sure everyone here thought it's Satan, the enemy. I just had a thought of someone yelling out, yeah, that's Bob. I work with Bob, and, and, you know, he's in accounting. That sounds exactly, no. That is, these are the traits of the seed of the serpent. And think about it in context of, of where Paul was earlier. He's saying, in Ephesians 2, he says, we were all practicing these traits following the prince of the power of the air. We, were, we had the wrath of God on us. We were following the enemy. We were imaging, in a sense, the enemy. And, and when we come to faith, we begin that process of imaging Christ. Uh, just a, a few scriptures here, John eight forty four, to show you where I'm coming from. This is Jesus rebuking the Pharisees. He says, you are of your father, the devil. This is, goes right back to Genesis. Seed, the offspring, of Satan. You are of your father. You are an offspring of Satan. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer. There's our anger. Anger, murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth. There's our lie because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. And John 10.10, referring to um, ultimately, to Satan, the thief comes only to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life. Satan is a lying, murderous thief. And here we have Paul in Ephesians saying, don't be a lying, murderous thief. Amen. Amen. Right? We, when we do that, and, and here's what I would want to just throw out there to give you maybe a category you've never thought of, when we act on these passions, these fleshly passions of lying and deceit and anger, um, and, and, and maybe instead of calling it stealing, uh, um, just being hoarding and, 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 and not being generous, we are acting like Satan. We are imaging Satan. Ask yourself, do I want to be like Christ 
or do I want to be like the father of lies? And that's, I know no one in here would say the, the, the father of lies. So we got to be thinking that when we, when we act like that, we are um, in the seed or in the, the stream of, of the enemy. All right. We're going to look at Ephesians 4, 29 and 31 together, and then we'll go back to 30. Paul continues, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. So again, if if we look at verse 29, you've got that same, no corrupting talk, don't let it happen, only what is good, the positive, as it fits the occasion, and the reason. Our speech should give grace to those who hear. Have you considered that? Again, I want to bring you back to how we opened up. Have you considered how powerful your words are? How powerful your words are. And this isn't We don't want to go, you know, the pendulum could swing to, you know, hey, never speaking the truth and only loving people. And that's not loving people. But just remember, your words are powerful. Proverbs 12, 18 to 19. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. Think about that. Are your words like sword thrusts? But the tongue of the wise brings healing Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. And if you think about that, I've been kind of meditating on that, that verse, truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is for a moment. And, and, and really, if you think about it, think about people who, uh, and we've all done it. We've all done it. You can shade the truth. You can say things a certain way to get what you want, leave something out, or you can outright lie. And that'll last for a moment. But sooner or later, you're going to be found out. Truthful words last. The truth lasts. Lies, but for a moment. But for a moment. To to control and manipulate what you're trying to control and manipulate, you might might work there, but sooner or later, you'll be found out. So I would ask you this morning, in terms of your speech, are you using your words for building people up? And especially in in the church. Are you using your words in the church to build people up, to encourage them, to strengthen them? What would it look like if that was always our first inclination? Oh, I I, I walk in the church, I see so-and-so, how can I build them up? How can I strengthen them? What might they need today to hear from me? And, and, and here's the reality. In order to do that, we need to know each other. So we need to be in fellowship. We need to know each other. Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. A word fitly spoken. You know, if you, one of the, the, the views that I get is pastor, um, that, that we're a small church, so you might have it too, depending on how plugged in is that you are. But one of the views that I get is I see that everyone in here is going through something. And, and some of the things that you're going through are heavy. So I know when you guys walk through that door, sometimes you're walking through way down by life. But we don't always think about each other like that because we're agitated, right? We, we might be agitated today, and it's like, don't they look at me wrong? That person looks at me wrong today. They're going to get it from me, right? Or I can't really deal with this person today. They, they annoy me, and right? That, that's normal. That's human. I mean, we can give space to each other. Like, that is just humanity, but we can't act on that anger or that annoyance. We need to build each other up. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold. Apples of gold. This word clamor here, um, when we look at verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger 
and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. So, so that idea of clamor, um, the, the thing that comes to mind is Twitter. When I read it, and I don't know if you're on Twitter, if, if, you're, if you are, I had to get off of it because all people are doing on Twitter are fighting and yelling and biting and devouring each other. And I, that's, the Christ, that's the pastors that I follow. Yep, and, and so I, I had to get off. But when I thought about clamor, and I looked it up, a loud and confused noise, especially that of people shouting vehemently. Like that's, that's our, kind of our online world, but we can all get sucked into clamor loud and confused and, and making sure people hear us and, and that, that is something we need to put away. We need to put it away. Paul is saying here the church needs to be different than the world. The church is a called out, set apart people. We are not to live like the world. If you didn't hear Adam's sermon a, a few weeks ago, which really set all, the, all these unity sermons um, up, it, it's a, it was a really good sermon. Adam is a pastor from Missio, where um, Vintage Faith has a relationship with Missio. Our elders um, are connected with their elders. But it was a really good sermon. If you didn't hear it, I would just tell you, go back to it. Um, it, it I thought it was very well done. But he, he quoted um, from Philippians 2, and he, Philippians 2, 1 to 4 says this, and he was talking about how we don't demand our rights as, as Christians. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is the path to unity. When we look at each other and we say, okay, I, I, it's not all about my interests. It's about this body. This is, again, think about this, not, not in this one in particular, in the church. It's about this body. None of us are going to have everything working and going the way that we exactly want it. I'm a, a pastor here, and it's not the way that I exactly want it. And I realize if it was the way that I exactly wanted, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> it would just be the way that I want it. And you guys would be like, that's kind of stupid. Um, that's the beauty of the body, right? We, we all make concessions and we all kind of come together and, and the Lord is doing something bigger than any of us. And, and we need to remember this does not come easy. Our passions, our emotions, our thinking, our flesh, our lust, it all wages war against what we're talking about here. It wages war against it. But through the Spirit, we can live like Christ. It is not impossible. We can, through the Spirit's power, live like this. We can shut our mouths and say, okay, I know I want to say that, and I know it's right, but maybe it's not the right time, and it's my, my, maybe my temperament is not exactly right to say it now. So I would ask again, how do you build others up with your words? And... Do your conversations with other people. Give them grace. Because that's what Paul's saying here, that, that we shouldn't have the corrupting talk. We should be, be building each other up, and that building up is, is the giving of grace for other people. So do your conversations with others. Give grace. Now we're going to go back to, to verse 30. Paul says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He's calling us back to Ephesians 1.13, where he says we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. If you, when we believe the word, you were born again, you were sealed with God's Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. So he's calling us back to, to 1.13, but he's also going all the way back to Isaiah, Isaiah 63, 10. And this is the prophet speaking of the wilderness generation. But they rebelled 
and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he's talking about the Israelites who rebelled and they grumbled. They grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. So we have to ask, okay, in, in this text, Paul is, is, is giving us a hint of Isaiah 63.10, and he's, he's going to the, Isra, uh, to the wilderness generation. How did the wilderness generation grieve the Holy Spirit? We've got to ask that question because it's right in the text, and it means something. So how did the Israelites, after they'd been freed from Egypt, freed from slavery, and, and seen all these miracles and seen God work in amazing ways, how did they grieve the Holy Spirit? Spirit. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They grumbled that they didn't have any bread. They grumbled that they didn't have any meat. They grumbled that they didn't have any water. They grumbled that they didn't have the vegetables and the meat that they once had in Egypt, even though they were enslaved. They grumbled at, at Aaron and, or Moses and Aaron and said, why are you leading? What makes you so special? They fought with each other. And this grieves the Spirit of God. It grieves Him. Again, we got to remember this is back to, to unity in the church. What grieves the Holy Spirit of God? It's when we bite and devour each other. The Holy Spirit of God is grieved when we grumble. How many of us And I know this is true in my life, so I, I confess. I'm confessing, so hopefully that gives you permission to confess too. But we've seen God move on a Sunday or a Monday or a Tuesday in an amazing way, and we're just moved, and we feel him touch down, and, and God is good, and by the next day, we're grumbling. Or maybe the day after. Or maybe the day after. But very soon after, we forget what he's done, and it's just, why don't I have this? Why don't I have that? Look at them. We grumble, and we have to remember that is not good. Well, in our text, when we lie to each other, the spirit is grieved. When we're not generous with each other, the spirit is grieved. When our speech tears down instead of builds up, the spirit is grieved. When we gossip instead of talking to someone um, that we, we have an issue with and we go to someone else, the spirit is grieved. Anything that we do up to stir up division within the body, the spirit is grieved. If you can remember back a, a few sermons, it was Ephesians 2, and I believe it was 11 to maybe 24 um, but we talked about Jew and Gentile coming together. And just the, the, if you remember that there was just hate, intense hatred between the Jews and the Gentiles. And Paul breaks this down and so, says the dividing wall of hostility is, is gone. In Christ, you're one man. And that, we don't have much of a, think of the, okay, here, here's where I, and I'm not going to ask you to say this out loud, but whether it's politically, whether it's nationally, whether, think of a group of people that for some reason you really just don't like. And I know we're in church and it's like, hey, can't, pastor, we, we shouldn't do that. Yes, but we do it. So think of that. Think of that person. Think of someone that you might have animosity towards. And then imagine that they come together in a, in a place like this and they become one and it's sweet and it's beautiful and the world can't understand it. This is Ephesians 3.10. So that through the church, this is, yes, speaking of the universal church, but it, it takes place in local churches. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Somehow, in our unity, the enemy looks and says, these people are all different. They should be fighting. They should be arguing. And 
And God says, no, I'm going to bring through Jesus' blood and forgiveness all these people that are very different economically, nationality, um, just all their thinking, what they're into, and I'm going to bring them together and they're going to love each other. And God says that shows his wisdom to the rulers and authorities. There's something in the unity. And when we're willing to divide over matters of conscience or small theological matters, we are breaking that unity. In some way, we are not reflecting the manifold wisdom of God when we bite and devour each other. The world will come in and say, this gathering is no different than anywhere else. I can go to a local bar and find people at each other's throats, right? So the church is different, and praise God, we've seen it. We just went through a pandemic two years where the whole world argued about everything, everything. Masks, whether we should be meeting or not, race, you name it. Everything was on the table for a fight, and this church flourished during it. Unity, the unity of the Spirit was maintained. Did you ever consider that when the local church like, looks just like the world, that the Spirit is grieved? Let me say that again. When the local church looks no different than the world, the Holy Spirit is grieved. We are a set-apart people. If you know Jesus, you are a set-apart people, and the church is a set a part organism, because that's the way that it's described, organism that functions differently than the world, but in the world. And how is this all possible? Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. First, we're to be a kind, tender-hearted people. A kind, tender-hearted people. The world looks at kind, tender-hearted people as weak. Looks at humility as, as weak. What looks strong is somebody that, hey, this person's going to get into it and, and argue in debate, and, and I'm not saying there isn't a place for that, but in the church, we're to be kind and tender-hearted and forgiving. This is how we keep unity in the Bible and in, in the body. This is how we keep the unity. And I just want to contrast that a minute for what I know is out there in in in, in the Christian world, which is be radical, be a world changer change your city, and all of that. And, and I would just say, I think when we read the Bible, we see much more of this. Be kind, be tenderhearted, live a quiet life, do your work, love the people that God has put in your orbit. That's going to change the world. You want to change the world? Change yourself first, right? Right? Change your family, change yourself, like change your, your orbit. So what undergirds all of this? We've been forgiven. In order to have a life where we live with, with this kind of humility and, and tenderness and, and forgiveness towards each other, we have had to have been forgiven in Christ. You can't live this life without the forgiveness of of Christ, And I would just ask you this morning, have you experienced this? Have you truly been forgiven in Christ? Do you find yourself having a hard time forgiving others? Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, fully God, fully man, lived and kept perfectly God's law with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his soul, perfectly kept it. He was the lamb without blemish. He is the lamb without spot or blemish. He is the Passover lamb. He's the lamb who was born to take away the sins of the world. And he took the penalty for sin on that cross. 
the justice and wrath of God the Father was poured out on Jesus. Brothers and sisters, he did not deserve this. Often my kids will, will say stuff like, that's not fair, and, and I try to get them out of that thinking because fair is not a word that, that, that is even remotely um, a real word in this life when you live and work and have a family. It was not fair for Jesus. He took the penalty that we deserved. And the Bible says that if, you have, if, if you've rejected Jesus, the offer of the cross, that the wrath of God is still on you. It's still on you. In fact, in Romans 2, Paul talks about the wrath being on you. It's like a river just being storing up. Imagine a, a damned river and it's storing up energy. That's Romans 2. It's the way he talks about God's wrath, ready to be released at that day, at the right time. And I've heard it said that it's as if Jesus is standing with his hand on the dam. And he's calling you with his other hand, saying, come, come to me. Like Steve read, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, come. And if you haven't done that, I would just say, why not? What is holding you back from experiencing the forgiveness of Jesus Christ? The gospel truth, this gospel truth, is what binds us all together. Yes, there's other truths that matter. You heard a few weeks ago where I was talking about, hey, we got we to gotta lean in to, to the knowledge of God. We got to up the, the, the knowledge game, and that builds unity, and that does. But this gospel is so magnificent and so life-changing that it binds us together. This is why we forgive one another. This is why we can be tender-hearted towards each other. We love because he first loved us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, as we digest uh, your scriptures, your, your holy word today, and um, I just pray that we can all work in our own hearts and see where we need to repent and, and turn to you and, and, and just remind us and that, that repentance is sweet. Lord, we do not want to image the enemy. We want to image Christ. Help us to be a church that does so, a church that is different from the world, in the world but not of the world. Lord, help us to remember that our speech has power, that we could change somebody's life with an encouraging word, a fit word, a properly spoken at the right time word, and we can also tear someone down with our words. As James said, we can, a forest is set ablaze by just a small spark, and we can do that with our mouths. So, Lord, help us to remember the power of our speech. Lord, we love you. Unite our hearts as we sing this last song together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for tuning in with us. We hope that you found this sermon edifying, encouraging, and challenging. To learn more about Vintage Faith Church, visit VintageFaithCicero.com. And of course, if you live in the area, we invite you to worship the Lord with us on Sunday mornings.